Hi everyone, this is lecture 4.1, Studying Religion as a Sociologist. Uh, this is going to be a lecture on why, uh, as sociologists, we study religion. Um, I think it's relatively self-evident. We want to study any phenomena that interests uh, any, really, almost any number of people. But religion itself, I think, is particularly interesting in terms of the field of study of sociology. Um, so while we have a relatively short lecture here, uh, I'm starting it with a relatively long quote. Uh, this is from page 239 in your book, and I think it really touches on some of the themes that we're going to discuss over the course of this unit. The danger of having government endorse a particular belief system, no matter how worthy it was, or in giving official status to any one religious group or tradition, no matter how pervasive is its influence, was potential tyranny. If a religious community could call on coercive power of the state to force conformity to its beliefs and practices, it lost its legitimacy. So, and this talks more to actually, uh, not necessarily the topic of this lecture, but following lectures, we're going to be talking about r religious majorities and how religious majorities can get out of whack, especially actually in democracies. Because in democracies, majorities rule, right? Well, what happens when that majority rule gets in the way of religious practice of the minority when it creates hegemony, which we've discussed already in the course, and we'll discuss in great detail in the, these lectures. But on to this lecture particular. Why do sociologists study religion, and how do the three sociological perspectives approach religion? So what particularly do sociologists study? Well, we study religious beliefs. Religious beliefs are statements to which members of a particular religion adhere. Um, we do not study how true the belief is. We, quite frankly, as social scientists, as a discipline, not as individuals, but as a discipline, aren't really concerned with how true a religion is. Uh, when I study the religious beliefs of people, you know, it's irrelevant whether, for example, God exists or heaven exists or whatever. I have different feelings about that as an individual, but as a sociologist, I'm studying the beliefs that individuals have. And that's somewhere that a sociologist who is Hindu, and a sociologist who is atheist, and a sociologist who is Christian, they can all build dialogue off that because we are all sociologists studying the things that people believe, not necessarily our own belief systems, which I think gives a tremendous strength to the study of sociology and helps further religious dialogue in our society. There are varying levels of intensity in terms of belief. Um, we have the religious mainstream, which are those people that are most integrated into society, and these are these levels are as they exist both in the United States and in most countries around the world. Most uh, places, in most places, uh, the religious mainstream is uh, probably most of religious people. These are the people that blend in real well, and their beliefs are more or less relatively moderate, and they can coexist very well with other people. Um, then we have religious fundamentalists. Those are people who are more strict or literalist about their faiths. Um, we will talk about this more when we talk about religion in the United States, but for example in the United States, uh, Christian fundamentalists, those that take uh, Christianity both very seriously and very literally, who believe that the Bible is absolute fact and everything that happened in it is exactly how it happened, those people are typically classified as religious fundamentalists. That doesn't mean that they're good or bad in what they believe, that's just the way they believe. And this uh, fundamentalism can have a tendency to separate those groups of people from uh, the mainstream 
dominant culture of society. And then we have religious extremists. These are people who are committed to their faith to the point of alienating others, right? They often sometimes started in fundamentalist communities and didn't think the fundamentalists were serious enough and then branched off and made their very own fringe extremist thing. Um, these uh, people's beliefs are often uh, uh, alienating to others and make it difficult for the outside world to interact with them. And uh, I shouldn't say often violent. These religious extremists are sometimes violent. Um, honestly, just because you have a bunch of people out in the woods doing their own uh, very different religious thing, that does not mean that they will be violent. Uh, extremists come from a very small little piece of those people who were fundamentalists and then fr within extremists the very there was a very small piece of those who uh, eventually do uh, turn violent but going on what do we study um i'm missing a little text here there we go sorry about that sociologists study uh religious rituals we um it's and religious rituals are very easy for us to study because they're actually physical actions people are doing right it doesn't rely on asking people what they believe which they could potentially lie about or tweak a little bit uh, based on what we want to hear uh, we can actually observe uh, we could film these things if uh, we were permitted we can you know write down what we see with our eyes a uh, very common example of this is the Christian communion ritual, uh, the Jewish uh, bar or bat mitzvah rituals, bat mitzvah uh, being for uh, young women uh, in reformed Jewish communities, or the Hajj rituals, uh, which are expected of um, Muslim people who go to uh, Mecca for that series of rituals. These are all things that we can actually observe happening um, and you know very interesting to us as sociologists so and it's more difficult for us to study these things called religious experience uh, than studying rituals but the reason why we study rituals is to document these things that inspire religious experience. The best way we can study religious experience is asking people to talk about it, asking the believers to talk to us about it. Uh, religious experience are feeling or perception of being in direct contact with ultimate reality or of being overcome with religious emotion. Uh, examples of this include, uh, for Christians, feeling God's love, whatever that may mean to that particular Christian sect. There are other religions too that talk about feeling God's love, but Christians are often very keen on talking about God's love or a personal relationship with Jesus or something like that. Uh, Buddhists may talk about uh, glimpsing nirvana. Um, nirvana in most interpretations of Buddhism is not necessarily something that happens to you after you die, which it, it can be, depending on your interpretation. But nirvana can also be something that is experienced in this life. Um, you know, phenomenologically kind of similar to feeling God's love, but, but different because it's based on a different set of beliefs. Uh, communing with ancestors is something that people of other religious uh, beliefs could experience. Uh, your uh, indigenous animists uh, or possibly uh, pagan groups or um, other um, groups that perform ancestor worship. This is also another form of religious experience that people can uh, feel based on uh, ritual uh, performance of rituals. Um, and again, it's, it doesn't matter if this is actually factually what's happening. What's factual is that people perceive it as happening. We study uh, problems in our society as relating to religion as well. So um, not only do we study the pieces of religion, we study uh, issues surrounding religion in terms of social problems. Uh, one 
Um, one major issue that I'm very concerned with is uh, that religion is almost never meaningfully discussed in public schools. Um, and this is largely because there are misperceptions as to what um, embracing diversity actually means. Um, people are afraid to talk about these things. And I fear that much of that comes from uh, administrators being feared, afraid of being sued. And because of that kind of mi mindset, and maybe sometimes because of frivolous lawsuits, I'm not usually one to say that lawsuits are frivolous, but that may be, uh, people are afraid to talk about religion in academic ways. And I honestly feel that talking about them in terms of the neutrality that sociology gives us, we can make real headway in terms of actually learning what other people believe about religion. Uh, most times we, we may know how our own religion works, which sometimes we might not, but we have almost no understanding of the religion of others, which is, is, is it's sad. It's, it's something that I don't like about our society. Um, a lack of understanding of religious in diversity in general uh, exists in our population which touches on my first point. Uh, this lack of understanding of religious diversity can contribute to hate crimes. If you don't understand uh, the holidays or the um, beliefs of your Muslim neighbors, for example, you might, not under you, you might have a less good understanding of them. You might get angry at them, and not necessarily you, but if enough people go on in that state of lack of understanding, eventually it could lead to violent conflicts between people. And um, additionally, uh, political parties do have a tendency to be uh, discriminatory if there are huge numbers of people that do not understand people of a given religion. And um, that is uh, greatly uh, disturbing. Uh, another, th for example, um, there, it's a great, fee, uh, what's it called, filtering process that occurs when political uh, people are running for office uh, where they must talk about their religion, where they must talk about how often they go to church, for example, or they must at least claim some kind of religion, not because of things that are built into the government, but because of things that are built into political parties themselves. And this prevents people of different religions from really being able to advance in the political system. We in the United States have had almost no, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure none, but I'm not going to hold myself to that. Uh, the vast majority of presidents of the United States have claimed one kind of Christianity or another. Uh, Barack Obama is actually a practicing Christian, but there is even a perception that he is a Muslim, and that perception of him being a Muslim um, harmed him within certain uh, areas. And that that's just, that's mind-boggling to me as a scholar of uh, religion. Now let's talk about religion and the three core sociological perspectives. Um, if you haven't necessarily uh, discussed uh, this since your uh, intro to social classes, you might want to crack open um, just like the first couple chapters and remind yourself about functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism. But from the functionalist perspective, religion serves to strengthen community solidarity and give answers to difficult questions. Uh, answers to questions such as, what do we do with this new baby? Right? So religion tells us what to do at confusing or stressful times in our lives. Well, what do we do with this new baby? We welcome the new baby in the community, we perform these rituals to make them part of our community, and we go on with our lives. What should, when should we consider this child an adult? This doesn't necessarily exist so much in Western religion, uh, but it does exist in some religions. For example, uh, within uh, the Jewish uh, tradition. Uh, the bar mitzvah ritual and the bat mitzvah ritual says this is a person who is an adult and part of our community and then therefore they have decision-making powers within that community. Uh, that does exist some in, um, in uh, Christianity in the United States, 
uh, there are certain, for example, I'm just speaking from my own experience, I grew up Presbyterian, once you are confirmed in the Presbyterian Church, you gain the ability to uh, have certain voting powers, and that also exists there. Uh, again, I'm just speaking to my own, pulling out that out of my head right now. Um, when should this adult get married, and what are the conditions that that marriage will be? That is something that is often dictated and thought about in a religious way. What should we do with this corpse? When somebody dies, that is not just a very sad thing, but it's actually a logistical problem, especially if you're in a society that's less than modern in terms of sanitation, right? A corpse is not only very sad that someone has died, but if you don't do something with it, it becomes very dangerous in terms of disease. So religions have set out, okay, we will do this thing of faith, and how do we get rid of it safely, right? Which, in terms of functionalism, and that uh, theoretical perspective, really speaks to it. And then, functionalists are also very interested in the sacred versus the profane. The sacred thing is the special thing, the not ordinary thing within religion and social life, but largely religion. Then profane things are normal, everyday stuff, right? So it's the stuff that is not necessarily bad, but not special. A good example of this um, occurs uh, around the world and in the United States in most places where uh, Christianity is practiced, or at least many places where Christianity is practiced, regarding the communion ritual. Uh, if you're not necessarily familiar with communion, uh, communion involves the consumption of some kind of bread and some kind of either wine or grape juice. And many churches use communion wafers, but not all do. Um, many churches use just plain bread. And many of those churches that use just plain bread, they don't bake it themselves because they don't like to have a committed bread bakery just for religious bread. They go buy it somewhere. That makes sense, right? In our society. So you can imagine on any given Saturday, the day before communion will take place, there is a secretary or somebody from the church that has to go, say, to Panera to buy that bread. Because Panera, you know, they make a nice pretty loaf. Uh, those nice big round loaves. So, in that moment, when the secretary for the church is waiting in line, there are breads up on the shelf, right? And in that moment, those loaves of bread are all profane in terms of religiosity. They're normal, just normal loaves of bread. They could be communion. They could be someone's turkey sandwich, right? But somewhere in the process of the bread being taken off the shelf, given to the secretary of the church, paid for, taken into the church, various rituals taking place depending on the denomination of the church and going up in front of the church and being broken in front of the congregation that is a sociological social process in which it becomes socially sacred right and that is something we study as sociologists the metaphysics are irrelevant whether it actually becomes the body of Christ is irrelevant. We study how it becomes socially uh, sacred. Conflict theory then uh, looks at religious religion as a tool of the rolling elite to oppress the masses. So if people are willing to suffer in this life in exchange for non-tangible rewards, they may be easier to exploit. That's the traditional conflict theorist perspective on that. And for a long time, conflict theorists only studied how religion was used to exploit people. And it was very negative toward religion for a very long time. But then eventually, in the mid-20th century, um, it was recognized by uh, social scientists that religion can also be used to overthrow and challenge authority. This is called liberation theology. Now, when liberation theology is with a capital L and a capital T, that
that is a very specific version of Roman Catholicism that um, and particularly tied with Jesuitism within the Catholic Church and that is specifically talking about uh, priests in Latin America who helped overthrow some very vicious local dictators but with a lowercase l and a lowercase t that term can be used to describe any situation where religion is used to overthrow and challenge authority uh, that type of liberation theology that term can be applied to Mahatma Gandhi in the Indian uh, liberation movement in the 1940s uh, that can be used to describe uh, the behavior of Martin Luther King and any other number of uh, people who were pushing for the rights of oppressed people within a religious context. And then finally, uh, symbolic interactionism, which is the perspective I often take when studying religion, uh, studies religion as a set of uh, rich symbols that can help interact with each other and communicate complex ideas. These are two frames from a series of uh, comic strips called the Chick Tracks. Uh, these are Christian fundamentalist comic strips. Uh, that I find are both um, very interesting and deeply troubling, but you know, that's why I study it. Um, we see complex symbols of uh, an individual on a cross, which is presumed to be Christ, right? Either a demon or the devil. We see John 8, 12, which to someone well-versed in uh, the church means a certain thing, right? And all these, these two frames are two series of very complex symbols. And how do those symbols get together? How do they accomplish the goal of the author? Um, that is what we study as symbolic interactionists. If you're particularly interested in the Chick Tracks, uh, you can uh, look at my website, profjeremybaker.com, if I remember my own website off the top of my head. Um, I have two, no, just one pretty interesting, um, presentation on the Chick Tracks themselves. But anyway, and that's an example of this type of research. Um, that is it for this lecture. Uh, there are, is some more content after this, but that's this one. Uh, either, you know, as you do, take a break or, uh, plug ahead to the next one.